Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our free webinar, St. Luke's Serving the Community. I'm Lauren Spence, Vice President of Major Events at the Greater Lehigh Valley Chamber of Commerce. We appreciate you joining us for today's program, which will provide you with a special inside look into St. Luke's Monroe campus. You'll hear from senior leaders and their top physicians and learn about what the hospital is doing to help the Pocono community. A huge thank you to the team at St. Luke's Monroe campus for sponsoring today's event and making this free webinar available to our community. Now some quick housekeeping. Today's program will have time allotted for question and answer. If you have a question for one of our presenters, you can type it directly into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Questions can be submitted this way at any time during the presentation, and we'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as we can at the end. This webinar is being recorded for you and will be available on the Chamber website in our webinar library. Finally, if you are an attendee today, don't worry about being on camera. Your audio and your video are turned off. Now, before we get started with today's panel discussion, we wanna give you the opportunity to take an inside look at the St. Luke's Monroe campus. Many of you have visited the campus, hopefully for chamber mixers as opposed to being patients, but we wanted to share this campus's growth over the last four years since it opened in Monroe County. Please check out this video. Extraordinary care. Outstanding patient experience. Accessible services. When you choose St. Luke's Monroe Campus, you choose compassionate care delivered by our highly trained staff of healthcare professionals, all powered by the strength of St. Luke's University Health Network. We don't just treat a disease, we treat a whole person. We don't just tell them what to do, we give them options. And we don't just treat one person, but we give help for the whole family. When you're coming in for a screening mammogram, there's really a very small chance that you'll be diagnosed with breast cancer. However, to get through those steps is incredibly anxiety creating. And we do our best to, to make that as quick as possible and to get patients through that high anxiety phase as quickly as possible too. The Monroe Breast Center is really our newest state-of-the-art breast center. We've taken everything we've learned from our other experiences and put them into this uh, state-of-the-art facility where patients move through real rapidly in a very serene environment. If a woman needs a, a biopsy on the same day, we can often do that for her. And for anyone who's been through that process, getting those steps done as soon as possible becomes the most important thing as you're going through it. So we're really set up to do that in an efficient way. St. Luke's overall is, is a, a system that I think we always put patient as number one and we treat everybody the same regardless of the background. I think we are able to provide the best quality of care in this area. Um, I feel confident to take care of patients. The common anemia or, or hematology, oncology issues, we are fully capable of, of treating patients and we do have um, a comprehensive knowledge and skills to make patients feel better. Through our great relationship with GE, uh, we are a show center for GE. Uh, we get the latest and greatest imaging equipment. We're highlighted at the breast center with something called Pristina, and that's the newest 3D mammogram unit. It takes into account patient comfort, uh, as well as the highest quality mammograms as well. So it's really a great leap forward for women's imaging. We also use automated breast ultrasound, and that's a non-radiation study that helps us find breast cancers in women with dense breasts. So it's a very effective tool as well. Cancer is a, is a really personal, emotional disease that, that affects not only the patient, but the families. The closer to home that we can provide those services for those patients, I think it not only benefits the patient, but the family to be able to receive that, that care close to home. And we have a high quality uh, cancer program and bringing that to Monroe County will will benefit our patients, but also their families as well. Our main job is to, to give hope to these patients and uh, to make them understand that uh, 
you know, the vast majority of these cases are going to turn out great and more and more are turning out great. I look forward to the continued success of uh, the St. Luke's campus and the St. Luke's network in Monroe County. In the short time we've been there with an inpatient hospital and seeing all the positive that we've done uh, just really excites me for what, what the future holds for, for St. Luke's and Monroe County. What an awesome inside look. Thank you so much. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters today. First up, we have the president of St. Luke's Monroe campus, Don Seifel. Hello, thanks for having us today. We have senior vice president of medical and academic affairs for St. Luke's and infectious disease specialist, Dr. Jeffrey Jari. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. We have medical director, North Region, St. Luke's Monroe Campus, Dr. Kristen Merrick. Good morning, thanks for having us. And critical care anesthesiologist, Medical Director of Critical Care Medicine at St. Luke's Monroe Campus, Dr. Eric Tessarero. Good morning, thanks for having us. Now, without further ado, let's dive right into our questions. This first one is for Don. We've seen a lot of growth in services offered at St. Luke's Monroe Campus since we opened in 2016, and prior to that with our physician practices located right here in the county. Don, can you talk about the ways in which St. Luke's has invested in Monroe County and what are some of the services provided at Monroe campus that our community should be aware of? Yeah, thank you. Well, initially, you know, um, when, we, when we started to uh, build our hospital in, uh, in Monroe County, you know, just at our campus alone, we invested about $130 million into this, into this project with the hospital and the medical office building, and we also did some road work in front of the hospital. So, you know, uh, big investment there. We also, you know, from a, from a job creation standpoint, uh, initially when we opened, we hired about 350 employees. And today, four years later, we employ about 750 employees. So in four years, we've seen a lot of growth and we've brought a lot of these really life-sustaining uh, jobs here to Monroe County. Um, uh, you know, and I think in addition to that, we continue to you know, we talked you in the videos, we talked about keeping care close to home, which is really something St. Luke's, uh, uh, it's really just part of how we provide care. And uh, over these last four years, we've brought a lot of care to Monroe County through um, many of our specialists now that are here in the county. Um, just, just about all of them uh, are here. We've expanded general surgery. You know, we have, uh, we have additional surgeons now that are uh, we started out with two, we brought on three, we just brought on a couple new orthopedic surgeons, you know, our, our cancer center, we highlighted our, our, our regional breast center in that video, but we've, we just brought on another uh, medical oncologist, uh, we're going to be shortly bringing on a surgical oncologist, so we, we have a real commitment to this community to continue to bring um, care to it, and, and really with the goal of keeping more and more people in this county. Can you tell us a little bit about the ways St. Luke's supports the school districts in Monroe County through throughout our community health initiatives? Yeah, you know, when we first came here to Monroe County um, with, our, with our hospital, um, spent a lot of time and we still spend a lot of time in the community getting to know those uh, around us, really understanding what the needs are of the community, even beyond the care that we give. And like any community, there's a lot of needs. You know, we start talking, and St. Luke's, St. Luke's has had a history of um, serving uh, the schools and the underserved in the schools. And so we felt it was a good place for us to start. For me, um, you can sometimes try to do too much and really not make a difference. And sometimes focusing in one area and starting, starting to show outcomes is a, is a better approach. And so that's what we did through the schools. We, we took the time to meet with all the school districts and. We uh, started with Pocono Mountain West. We felt it was the area that, that the school district that had the greatest need and really have had a great relationship with the, with the uh, administrative team and the teachers there. Um, we've hired a community health liaison and we began to focus on three key areas, which were um, dental, uh, healthy living, and eye care, and uh, along with um, employee wellness. And we continue, we continue with those initiatives uh, even to this day. Uh, and more recently, we've started to um, 
uh, start to have conversations in the Pleasant Valley School District around areas where we could help to meet their needs as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that, Don, and thank you for all the amazing work you're doing in our communities, especially in our schools. You're welcome. Well, next, we are going to hear from Dr. Tesserero. Hello again. Hi. Dr. Tesserero, you are the medical director of critical care medicine at Monroe Campus. Can you talk about what type of patients you're prepared to treat in your department? Sure, thank you. So we at the Monroe Campus are prepared to care for a variety of patients who are very ill with state-of-the-art equipment and a compassionate team. We made a promise to care for patients locally and maintain their health. And we deliver on that promise with what we technically call a level two ICU. So that means that we can care for our patients do complex procedures and treat a variety of illnesses, including cardiac and respiratory ailments, infections, and many other conditions, and offer specialized care for kidney injuries and need for dialysis. With a team of specialists and consultants, we're here to care for you. Um, we strive to meet our goal to care for patients in the community, but occasionally we do need subspecialists and the support of a university health system, and we have that available to us at our Fountain Hill site. Awesome, thank you so much. Can you also speak to the importance of not delaying medical care during this time? Absolutely, so like you said, I wear two hats. I'm both a critical care physician and anesthesiologist. So this actually touches on both sides of that. Um, during COVID, we saw that patients presented for care later with cardiac issues and strokes, um, and that led to more severe disease and complications. And with early treatment, most of those presentations would have been more preventable and had better outcomes. The single most important thing that people can do is continue to take care of their health and that of their family members. It's okay to take care of yourselves. Our hospitals are safe and ready to care for you. Um, we follow strict safety protocols, universal masking, screening of visitors and employees, um, and our facilities are safe. There's some national trends that we're seeing right now where patients aren't seeing their doctors for well visits. And in fact, there's probably been about a 50% reduction this year in screening for um, cancers um, that are indicated based on patients' age and gender. With regular appropriate care, like annual physicals, screenings, and blood work, um, you can feel assured that your health is a top priority and you're taking care of your health. Please don't let COVID take care of, uh, prevent you from taking care of your health and know we're here for you. Such an important message. Thank you so much, Dr. Chesserano. Absolutely. Next, I have a question for Dr. Merritt. Hi. Hello again. Hi. Hello. You are the medical director of the Northeast region and in primary care. Can you let us know what recent changes have happened in primary care in Monroe? Yes, yeah, so it's been an exciting time in primary care. We are growing and over the last couple of months, we've hired three new primary care physicians in Monroe County as well as several nurse practitioners and physician assistants. So we really are expanding in primary care, which is very exciting. We're opening a new uh, internal medicine office in Bartonsville, which will combine two of our current internal medicine offices um, at a new site. So we're expanding there as well. Um, so we're very committed to primary care as Dr. Tesserero uh, mentioned, it's so important for patients to continue following with primary care to get screenings and physicals and just maintain their health care and um, health maintenance. So we also have internal medicine residents who are rotating at our hospital and at different sites in the outpatient setting. And a lot of these residents are committing to staying in the area for um, practicing in primary care. So very exciting. Is there any new technology or other exciting additions to the network and Monroe campus that the community should be aware of? Yes, so we have really um, embraced a lot of the new technology that has really um, ramped up during COVID, especially um, St. Luke's has a relationship with Microsoft. So we were able to really implement virtual visits in a timely fashion. We ramped it up very quickly and effectively at the beginning of the pandemic. So patients were able to schedule virtual visits and telemedicine visits with their physicians and in primary care as well as specialty um, so that the, there was no gaps in care during that time. Patients really appreciate being able to see their physician from the safety of their own home. Um, so we are continuing with virtual visits. There are a lot of safety protocols in place now and, and patients are feeling more comfortable coming back into the office. So uh, we are 
seeing that happening, but the virtual visits are still an option, which is um, awesome. So we are doing, you know, both and um, the technology has been very helpful for that. No, it really is awesome. I actually personally did my first televisit um, during quarantine and it was such a cool experience. So yeah, can definitely attest really for the, what an awesome innovation that is. So thank you so much, Dr. Merrick. Yeah, thank um, you. A friendly reminder to everyone, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask any of our panelists today, please submit them into the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Next, it is my pleasure to chat with Dr. Jari. Hello. Hello. Question for you, in general, how did this pandemic affect St. Luke's? The good thing about the pandemic, if there is any good thing, is that it highlighted <laughs> our culture. Uh, which really, I think, is extraordinary. And it emanates from our CEO, Richard Anderson. We like to think of ourselves as a family. And good families are not there to just support your successes, but obviously, more importantly, to be around and support each other when you have challenges. And COVID-19 certainly has been a challenge. What we were able to do at that point in time is we were very collaborative. We helped each other. We were able to make certain that people had roles that they could excel in. And equally important, we allowed people to be independent and innovative when that was necessary. We didn't micromanage people. And when they needed help, we were there. When, we did, when they didn't need help, uh, then obviously we didn't have to be there. Uh, the other thing that I think is extremely important is it illustrated the power of network. Uh, we have 12 hospitals. And so when we had particular issues uh, because of an excess of cases in one area, and I think the people at Monroe County know that early on in April, Monroe was extraordinarily hit out of proportion to other areas. So we were able to help Monroe out by transferring personnel, transferring equipment when necessary, and in some situations, actually transferring patients. So we were never able to really hit a crisis standpoint, which many other areas around the country did because we could offload and help each other when that was necessary. Uh, the other thing that I really think we uh, should illustrate, because I, and I know that uh, Eric is too modest to actually say so, is I, I, I have a slide of innovations that shows the kind of example that we were talking about when we allowed people to kind of do their own thing. So if I could show that, that innovation slide. Let's see if you can do the, the first one after that. There we go. All right, so on the, on the left, what you see over there is what we finally call a zapper, uh, which is an ultraviolet uh, device that Eric and his colleagues, uh, not only in-house, but also at Lehigh University developed to help expand our supply of PPE. I think those of you who are out there know one of the things that was immediately apparent in many places is that there was a shortage of, of protective equipment, particularly the kinds of masks that would protect personnel known as N95 masks, which at one point were only single usage. They developed this machine that can sterilize these so that it can be used over and over again safely and therefore expand our supply. We were able to do over a thousand uh, masks a day and there's a patent pending on that and that we have shared. So it's really been, I, I think, uh, an example of the kind of innovation when you have bright people and you let them do their own thing. And another example is what you see on the right. Those are very specialized 3D printed masks that are N95 masks that again can be used over and over again. We were the first to develop this and it's a very specialized mask uh, and it was actually written up in the Wall Street Journal. And again, it's an example of what can happen when you have right people, you support them and you let them do their own thing. Those are so cool. I love the logo right in the middle of the masks too. Very awesome. Thank you so much for sharing those innovations with us. We're all very interest in, interested in what's happening with COVID-19 in our community and in Pennsylvania. Dr. Jari, can you share what Pennsylvania and our counties look like? with numbers and if the anticipated increase in cases for the fall will continue. All right, I'm gonna try and do that then. Uh, and again, I have some slides that I hope will help illustrate the kind of issues that we are now facing. So if I could 
get on to the uh, back to the slide deck. And we're going to go. There we go. All right. So um, these are the slides basically as of yesterday. And I think if you take a look at that, you can see that between confirmed and probable cases in Pennsylvania, we have about roughly 215,000 and almost 9,000 deaths. Uh, that uh, obviously is a striking figure, but I want to try and put it into some kind of proportion, and that has to do with some of the things that you see on your right, and I'm going to go into that in a little detail, but fairly rapidly because of time constraints. So if I could have the next slide. What you see over here is, are the uh, cases in Pennsylvania uh, really from the beginning of the pandemic to now, and I think it's very illustrative that back in April, you have a particular spike on the left. And then if you go all the way out to the right, you can see that there now not only is a spike that is the same, um, uh, but actually even in excess of what we had in April. So what we are seeing right now statewide is many more cases, and I'm using the word cases of COVID-19 that are diagnosed, and we actually had during what we considered the dark days of April. So let's try and put a little proportionality on that by the next slide. So again, uh, for illustrative uh, purposes, you can see the two spikes on the left. But what I want you to take a, a particular look at are the, the death slides on the right. Uh, and you can see that back in April and May, there were rather high peaks of deaths. And then going all the way over to the right, the curve has really not increased despite the increase in cases. So again, we are seeing many more cases, but we have much better methods at our, at our disposal right now to kind of avoid some of the major issues in terms of deaths. And there's also a, a problem in the sense that we are seeing more cases in younger people, and we know that younger people tend to have less complications and less, uh, in, uh, fortunately, in the way of mortality. Next slide, please. And another illustration uh, that I, I think can help us put this in perspective, that the serious people with this disease are in the hospital. And if you take a look back in April and May, you can see in Pennsylvania, there was a very high peak. It then went down quite a bit. Uh, so that a month, a month and a half ago, we were really pretty much at a low point. Now, the only warning sign is that we're starting to see these hospitalizations creep up. It hasn't hit what we had in April and May. We're hoping that it won't, but again, that remains to be seen. Another very important point is that the most serious patients in a hospital require ventilation, artificial ventilation. And you can see that in April and May, there was a peak. And despite the fact that we've seen major increases in our hospitalizations in the last few weeks, the amount of people on a ventilator is certainly still much smaller. And that's a good thing, and it, it speaks to our better management. So if you are, get this disease, you're less likely to be in the hospital. If you're in the hospital, you're less likely to have major complications, and you're, such, you're certainly more likely to survive. Uh, next slide. So let's try and bring it down to kind of, uh, we talked about Pennsylvania as a whole. And if you take a look at this, the darker areas are the areas that tend to have the most cases. And this was as of yesterday. And you can see uh, we're talking about not numbers of cases, because clearly if you look at Philadelphia or, or, or Pittsburgh urban areas, they're gonna have very high numbers. It really re matters in terms of cases per capita. And so some of the areas that are hot spots are in the middle of the state because we're seeing colleges and universities, unfortunately, where people are not necessarily adhering to the kinds of things that we, we know work, like uh, in state college, there's a, a big outbreak. Now, unfortunately, if you take a look at Lehigh and Northampton County to the right, where you see Allentown, you can see that those areas are darkening. The good news is up north, in your area, at Monroe County, it, we have not seen the same kind of rise that would put us into a hotspot area yet. And we're hoping, of course, that we won't. 
Uh, that's not true in uh, areas like Luzerne County, Lackawanna County, Berks County, and Schuylkill County. If I can have the next slide, please. So let's take a look at Monroe County uh, specifically. And again, I, I here you can see the major peak that, that you had that was disproportional really to the rest of the state back in April. And if you take a look all the way over to the right, you can see that there may be a rise, but it's certainly not so far, and we're hoping it won't be what it was back in April. Next slide, please. How is this really uh, affecting things in terms of your school's uh, system. So let me quickly go into this. When we try and figure out what's gonna happen with the school system, the important column is what you see in the middle, and that's new cases in the past seven days. And this is actually compiled by our Department of Health every Friday. So what you see over here is during the last uh, compilation. And if you take a look at uh, Monroe County, the number that's important is that you need to be below 100. Um, if you're above 100, now you're in the substantial range and that's when schools are gonna end up uh, being uh, virtually only. So Monroe County in the last seven days was well below 100 and almost 70, but you can see the areas that are not and that would include Berks County and uh, Northampton County and Lehigh County are, have now creeped up to the area where we are above that, uh, that substantial range. Next slide, please. And again, this is another illustration of how, these, how this pans out when it comes to what decisions are made with schools. And, and I've circled uh, the areas that are above that uh, seven day rate. And you can see those in front of you. And I think, again, if you look at Monroe County, uh, you can see that the, the number that the state used last week was low. Next slide. So last, let's bring it down to uh, more or less a local level and Don can actually talk about what's going on at uh, St. Luke's Monroe right now. But what we're looking at here is the total census within all of our hospitals, that's 12 hospitals. And you can see that back in April, it was very, very high and it is not anywhere near that as we get over to the right. We're roughly today somewhere in the area of about 60 cases, but it is rising. And so we don't know how that's going to play out, but we're hoping that we never reach the kind of, of peaks that we had back in April. Next slide. And I think this may be my last one. So this gives you an idea when we talk about power of network and why it's important. Uh, as of yesterday, you can see how many people we actually had in our uh, hospitals. And I want you to take a look at the daily census at the uh, campuses that we have over here. And if you look at Monroe, there were three people uh, who had COVID-19 diagnosed within Monroe, but some of our hospitals were actually hit very heavily. Like we talked about Schuylkill County where our Orgsburg campus is and obviously uh, Bethlehem because we tend to have a lot of transfers in. But when you take a look at this, the important thing is there are areas that are high, there are areas that are low. And so that if we start to now hit bad times within some of these hospitals, we can do what we did back in April when we helped out Monroe County. We can transfer patients, we can transfer personnel, we can transfer equipment so that we're hopefully never going to hit the kind of crisis standpoint that they hit in places like New York City. And I think I'm going to stop over here and I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you so much, Dr. Jari, for sharing all of that incredible and up to the minute data. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. We do have one more question for you. Do you mind speaking to the flu season so far and what we're seeing in terms of flu cases compared to previous years? Has our population masking and taking more precautions with social gatherings and re school restrictions contributed to a decrease in flu volumes? The kind of precautions that we advise to avoid COVID-19, which we're talking about social distancing, masking and, and uh, hand hygiene are also extremely effective for other respiratory diseases like, like influenza. So again, if there's any kind of, of, of silver, silver lining to this is that if people are doing the right thing, hopefully we'll have a low flu season. So far that seems to be panning out. We have had flu cases in the state, 
But throughout my, uh, the state and certainly uh, the United States as a whole, we have not seen the kind of peaks that we might have ordinarily seen. And if we take some lessons from the Southern Hemisphere around the world where they usually have a flu season before we do, they did not see a major flu season. Mm -hmm. However, I wanna just make sure that everybody knows that we don't know whether this will hold out or not. We know that you can have both of these diseases and obviously that's not a good thing. So I would encourage anyone out there who has not had the influenza vaccine to please do so. This is the perfect time to get it. Don't wait, let's not wait until there may be a shortage of vaccine or when we have a crisis, it takes a few weeks for the vaccine to take effect. So please get your flu shot. Get your flu shots, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Jari. My next uh, couple questions are for Dr. Tessarero. Sorry about that. Hello. Hi. Dr. Tessarero, I am sure hospitals have had to pivot in how they operate given COVID-19. Can you talk about the ways in which the Monroe campus has had to change operations to ensure safety for your patients in the community? And can you also talk about the clinical protocols for COVID patients at your hospital? Absolutely. So yeah, we had to pivot. Um, and a lot of that pivoting included just strict safety protocols with assurance that our employees were protected and our patients were protected. Um, we put a lot of that together while we were seeing what was evolving over March and April. And in doing that, our proximity to New York City and the New York metropolitan area, we were hit first. Um, and luckily, we were putting things together based on the initial projections at that time. So luckily, in retrospect, we were overly prepared. Um, so we prepared by supporting all of our departments. Um, if you drove by our hospital in that time, you probably saw a surge tent outside of the hospital based on what was being projected at that time. Luckily, we never had to use that tent. In the first wave though, um, like Dr. Jari was saying, going through the statistics, that real need was both in the hospital and in the ICU. Um, and so we were actually able to create additional ICU beds and we actually were able to cross train staff to make sure that they were able to care for these patients both locally and at the network level. And like Dr. Jari mentioned in earlier slides, that support of the full network was fantastic because we were able to have additional personnel available to us to make sure that we can care for these patients. And then in those few circumstances where it was necessary to transfer them to higher levels of care or to make sure they were safely taken care of. All of our daily routines were altered. Um, at the peak of COVID, elective surgeries did have to be halted just to make sure um, we had sufficient space within the hospitals and the public was protected and not exposed to anything. We're back in full swing now. So. For the safety of our community, we also had to restrict our visitors completely, and that's actually been able to be liberalized too. I think like everybody has mentioned, the most important thing we learned is the capability and ingenuity of our staff. Um, during COVID itself, um, there was a multidisciplinary team of critical care physicians, infectious disease physicians, and pulmonary specialists who sat down and they worked on a protocol that was trying to put together some evidence of available at the time. Um, and this protocol was just a scientific look at all the medications and therapies were available. And over time, those medications have evolved a little bit um, as new evidence has become available. And those therapies were things um, just as simple as laying on your stomach, what we call proning within the hospital that improves oxygen levels and other techniques like that just with the goal of never progressing to the ICU level of illness. Every week that team meets to sit down and look over what happened and what's changed in the literature. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be able to say that St. Luke's as a whole has a lower rate of mortality for treating patients with COVID than the national standard. Thank you so much. I know we talked a, a bit about the upcoming winter flu season and concerns with COVID. Is the hospital prepared for a potential second wave? Absolutely, we're prepared. Everything that we learned you know, in those dark days, as Dr. Jari said in March and April, is still relevant today. Um, I'm pleased to say that with the priority and safety of our staff, um, we have PPE that's available to us. Um, it was a priority for our network to make sure that we both were able to sterilize PPE early um, to make sure it was available. And now looking forward, we've invested in a company to make sure that we have sourced PPE for us. We don't know for certain right now whether or not there will be another surge, 
with everything novel, we're learning more and ever, more and more every day. And fortunately, we have more knowledge and experience than we did in March. And I think that's a really important part to highlight. Our clinical protocols are guiding us every day. And as everybody has said, this year is just so important to get your flu shot and not wait. It's preventable. Um, so get your flu shot. And I think the most important thing I think about is this just seems like a really long year altogether. And it feels like this pandemic is dragging on, but all the low tech things that we're doing and all of the basics are really what matter and keeping us safe. So please continue to wear your mask, socially distance, wash your hands. Such an important message. Thank you so much. Can you speak to the recent hospitalization rates? Are they low, high? How do they compare to the case count? Sure, so like you saw on that slide just a couple minutes ago, um, compared to March and April, the cases that we're seeing are not quite as volumitous or not quite as high as we were seeing during the peak of COVID, nor are we appearing to see the same degree of illness in our hospitalized patients. You saw on that slide, that the number of patients who require an ICU level of care or mechanical ventilation, so um, the ventilator, they're not there. So we're all vigilantly watching those numbers and hopeful. And I think that this just highlights that as time has gone on, we have more therapies that are available earlier on to prevent patients from getting as sick. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering those questions. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. My next set of questions are for Dr. Merritt. Hi. Hello again. Dr. Merritt, can you speak to the difference between COVID, cold like symptoms, flu symptoms? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, a lot of times these upper respiratory illnesses can present in a similar way. So it can be very challenging to differentiate between COVID, flu, and the common cold. Um, so COVID and influenza uh, often both have include um, fevers, chills, body aches, a cough, um, often a headache, and sometimes gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea and vomiting, as well as sore throat. Some things that are more unique to COVID, um, we are seeing more patients with shortness of breath and respiratory difficulties, as well as a new and sudden onset of loss of taste and smell. So that is a fairly unique symptom. Not everybody gets it, but if we do hear that, um, it does alert us to think about COVID. Um, the common cold typically presents with sore throat, congestion, cough, uh, very rare to have a fever or shortness of breath or the change in taste of smell with the common cold. All good things to look out for. Thank you. When do you advise that a patient should call their primary care physician and ask for a COVID test? Yeah, so anytime you have symptoms that, that we just discussed that may be concerning for COVID or um, you think you might, it's always a good idea to call. We do triage patients over the phone and we offer virtual visits uh, for patients who we're not sure if they need to be screened. So we usually start out with a virtual visit and assess the patient over the phone and then we offer testing at mobile testing sites throughout our network in Monroe County. It's in Broadheadsville. So the patient will call the primary care physician. The order will be placed and they can drive through our mobile testing site to be tested for COVID there. You should also call if you've been exposed to somebody who has known COVID. Um, so if it was a prolonged exposure, especially, so that would be within six feet of that person for a total of 15 minutes or longer. And then other patients need to be tested because of travel purposes or perhaps for surgeries or preoperatively. So those patients are also being screened. Um, if you don't have a primary care physician, there is a hotline that a, patients can call. It's on the website. So you can also get a test ordered through that system as well. Good to know, thank you. One more question for you. Uh, what are the trends that you are seeing with patients coming into your office with COVID? Yes, yeah, so we are seeing an increase of um, mental health issues recently. Um, unfortunately, during the pandemic, you know, everybody has been isolated. Mm -hmm. Our routines have been disrupted and a lot of, you know, loss of jobs and, and things along those lines. Mm -hmm. So we have seen anxiety and depression uh, as a, a trend and you know patients are 
reaching out, which is important. So if, if anyone is struggling with those issues, it's important to, to reach out to your primary care physician. And some things to keep in mind are um, uh, not to focus on the news too much. You know, I recommend just real, you know, finding one reliable source for information and um, not, you know, there's too much information out there and sometimes that can be overwhelming for people. Um, also just, you know, trying to find alternative ways to have fun and, and create ways, things to look forward to, whether that's virtually or, or through new activities or hobbies that you may enjoy. And um, also just, you know, not focusing on what other people are doing, but trying to focus on yourself, find, you know, figure out things that you're comfortable and safe doing and um, trying to tune out what others are, are trying to say as well. So those are all important, but, you know, always good to reach out to primary care if you're having issues with anxiety or depression. Such good advice. Thank you so much, Dr. Merrick. We appreciate it. Thank you. My next uh, few questions are for Don. Hello again. Hi there. Throughout, <laughs> throughout this COVID pandemic, uh, what kind of support did the campus receive? You know, in addition to what Dr. Jari mentioned earlier from our network, which was, you know, really important uh, for our campus, you know, the community um, is kind of what I want to focus on. And, you know, as I came to the Monroe County over five years ago when we were planning this hospital, I started to meet you know, many people in this community and realized how, um, how great of a community is, how giving of a community is, how they really do take care of themselves. Um, you know, like it, during COVID that just all came out and you know, um, the outpouring of personal protective equipment and food, oh my gosh, food. Um, you know, we had people writing messages in chalk on our sidewalk. And, you know, we, we, Dr. Jerry, and, you know, I know that Dr. Jerry and Dr. Tesserell talked about, you know, kind of those early days being dark. And I can tell you, I was here with the team and, and it was, it was a really, uh, really challenging time because, you know, our caregivers, our doctors, our nurses, our respiratory therapists, our patient care assistants, you know, they were, they were just giving their all to these patients and um, and just not seeing positive results. And it was really hard. And I think these little acts of kindness with the chalk on the messages, the hope rocks like you see on the, on the um, screen here, the drawings from the kids at the schools. I can't tell you how much um, they meant to us to every day to get up and come in and you know, I get emotional thinking about it, to be honest with you. It was a really hard time for everyone, very stressful. Uh, we had a prayer night. You can see the picture there, the pastor. Uh, that was that was really cool. We had our EMS night where they came and did a, a bunch of laps around the hospital and the staff came out. Again, very emotional night uh, for everyone. And I, I just, I don't think I'll be able to thank people enough for what they did for us, uh, especially in that beginning, in those beginning times. I'm so glad you captured all these photos of the outpouring of love and uh, that you received. I think such a good testament to the work that you do for this community and how grateful everyone is. So thank you. Okay. Uh, just a friendly reminder again to all of our attendees, we do have open Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A box that you can find right at the bottom of your screen. Awesome. Don, what are uh, what is the hospital doing to ensure the safety of your patients and employees during COVID? Yeah, so you know, even prior to COVID, obviously in hospitals, we put a lot of work and a lot of time into cleanliness, and you know, um, our patient outcomes obviously are very very important to us, and cleanliness and reducing infections and all those things have always been a a focus of ours and a focus of healthcare, and obviously with COVID. We've taken some additional steps where, uh, you know, early on we began to have all of our employees masking and we still do that to this day. And um, we ask all of our visitors that come in to mask, it's a requirement. Uh, we screen all of our visitors that come in, uh, kind of the general health screening, screening that we've probably all answered now probably a hundred times because we've been to different locate, you know, different um, places that are screening. Um, cleaning of high touch areas, um, the hand hygiene, you know, the, just 
just all of those those things that we've you know in our in our waiting rooms in our cafeteria removing chairs so that we maintain social distancing and for many tests you have the option to do online check-in uh, prior to coming online copay you know i've had a number of visits where we've done the, i've done a virtual visit which you know for certain types of visits works really well other ones i've had to go in person and i call and they let me know when i'm ready and they take me right into the room um, you know, at the hospital, um, we give, for some tests, we'll do the same thing or we'll give people the option to wait in their car and we'll call them when we're ready for them. So just, we continue to look at our processes to, to see how we can continue to, to just improve and, and, and give people that comfort that they're, that they are safe. I'm curious, do you think some of these innovations and a virtual options that you're providing, do you think they'll carry over once we're through with this pandemic? Do you think you'll continue offering them? I do. I think, um, you know, at the height of COVID, we, we were almost exclusively um, virtual. You know, some of it will depend on, you know, insurance companies and the government as far as whether they'll continue to pay for them. But absolutely, even before COVID, we had a virtual platform that you could, you know, call our care nows. And I, I used it, you know, before COVID. And again, I had some poison ivy. It was perfect. Oh, you know, no. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't have to, uh, I didn't have to leave the house. I, t I tell a kind of a shameless story. It was like a Saturday. My wife and I both got it. We were working in the yard and I had gone first and then she had gotten and she was getting ready to go to the care now. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, I don't want to go to the care now. Like it's a Saturday morning. So I'm like, let's call in. And so we called in and she got the help she needed and I didn't have to get off the couch. So it worked really well and she got what she needed. So I do believe that uh, some of these innovations will certainly continue beyond COVID. Awesome. What do you see in the future for Monroe campus? You know, um, we just finished up our town hall meetings uh, a little while ago, and we do them pretty regular with our team. And we were in virtual this year. Usually they're in person. So, um, but, you know, one of the things that I shared with that group is, you know, we've been open four years now, and I'm just as excited today as I was four years ago when we were opening, because I still see all of the opportunity for us to continue to provide great care and bring more services to Monroe County. And so, like I mentioned earlier, not only have we opened up our hospital and Broadheadsville, we opened up a, 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 you know, a health center and up the road, we opened a specialty care building and down the street, we opened another building that has many, many medical offices, you know, in, uh, next August, our plan is to open a health center in Mount Pocono. It's, it's currently underway. We're looking additionally in Broadheadsville for another location and over in East Stroudsburg. So just continued growth on the inpatient side, you know, it continuing to expand our, uh, our surgery and the services we offer and the, the amount of patients we can serve. It's just, it truly is exciting. And Jeff talked about our network and our culture and you know, certainly COVID has highlighted that, but I can tell you, we have a network and a culture that people are, you know, uh, our, our providers, our staff, they're used to adapting and, you know, if they need to split their time between two campuses or shift their practice, you know, it happens fairly seamlessly. And I think that's what's allowed us to be successful here in Monroe County. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. I really appreciate your insight into everything that the campus is doing and all of the work that you and St. Luke's are doing. So thank you. Absolutely. With that, we are diving into our audience uh, Q&A portion of the program for the last 10 minutes. So I see we have one question submitted as of now. Reminder, put your questions into the Q&A. This is such an awesome opportunity to speak directly with the senior leadership and with St. Luke's top position. So any questions you have, put them in. We'll get to as many of them as we can. So this first one is from Jim. He asks, if you are searching for a primary care physician, is there any way that St. Luke's does a sort of patient doctor pre-meeting? You know, I'll let Dr. Merrick take, a, take, take, take that question and if, afterwards, if I have to, I can certainly add to it. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I, there's no specific, you know, way that you can meet and greet with the physician ahead of time, but I do encourage patients to check the website. You know, we have a pretty extensive website, 
So you can always search on there for, you know, there's a find a doctor uh, feature. And so you can check that out. And then there's physician bios on there. So there'll be more detail about each provider on the website. Uh, would also encourage if there's a physician you're thinking about establishing with, you could always reach out to the practice and, um, you know, talk to the staff and see if they can recommend a certain provider within the office because certain providers might specialize in certain things or if you're looking for a male or a female, something like that, um, you know, the staff is very knowledgeable and could point you in the right direction. But and a lot of times it's word of, word of mouth. So just speaking to friends and family and, and finding out from their perspective who they might see for their primary care physician as well. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I would just add to Dr. Merrick, our, the, the online directory we have, some of our, some of our doctors have uh, videos as well, like short videos in, in addition to their bio. So that's kind of neat. You can, you can kind of see them and hear them talk and get a feel for them as well. Awesome. Thank you, thank you so much. While I give everyone uh, another moment or so to put in any questions that they have, Don, do you have any other parting thoughts that you would like to share with our attendees? I know a big message that I heard today, get your flu shot, keep washing your hands. Anything yeah. else you need to share? Yeah, I just wanna reiterate, I think Dr. Uh, Jerry mentioned it, Dr. Tessarero mentioned it, is really, you know, I think when we look at across the 10 county region, you know, I get, updated numbers. Dr. Jerry gets them every day. We look at them. You know, Monroe is, has consistently been the third lowest county in the 10 county regions for at a, from a rate standpoint of COVID cases. And I think early on Monroe County really uh, embraced the, the, the masking, the social distancing, the hand washing, and, and really has done a really good job of keeping our numbers low uh, for new cases as well as hospitalization. And I believe if we continue to do that, we'll, we'll be able to really, um, uh, you know, we talked about early on trying to live with this virus until we, you know, until we do get a vaccination and, and we, we can start to eradicate it. But for now, I think that's really the biggest thing I just want to continue to emphasize. And from my experience going around the county in general, people are doing that. And I, th I think the other thing is with Christmas coming and Thanksgiving coming, um, college students coming home. I don't know. Maybe that's a good one for Dr. Jerry to talk about some of those recommendations. We've been talking about it internally in St. Luke's, but he might be a better person just to talk about some of these events that are coming up and what we need to do as a uh, as a community. If he's not there, then I can certainly talk to him. There he is. I'd be happy to uh, just mention that the largest increase in group uh, COVID-19 acquisition is in the 19 to 24 year old age group. And obviously that's your college student age group. We know that uh, that's a tough group to keep at home. And uh, they have certainly uh, been responsible in a lot of ways for the, the outbreaks that have been surrounding college campuses. Uh, all of the colleges are going to be dismissing their students as of Thanksgiving, and they won't be coming back until January, which means that for six or seven weeks, they're going to be home. And it's going to be very important, I think, to make them toe the line. Uh, and that's a tough, it's a tough job to do that, uh, because obviously they know that they're not going to have the same kind of disease in general that older adults do but they certainly can and have and do transfer that to the older adults who are living at home. So it's extremely important to make sure that that messaging gets across. And the other thing that we're telling people is if they're coming from states that are in high risk right now, and there are about 43 states in that area, that they really should be, be fairly well quarantined for two weeks uh, because you don't know whether they're bringing back uh, the uh, COVID-19 virus with them. And so that, again, prudence and conservatism over here would pay off. Thank you, Dr. Dari. Welcome. We have one more question that just came through. Uh, William asks, can you comment uh, about integration between EMS and the hospital? You know, I, I know I, I probably can't, uh, I probably don't have enough details about that. I don't know that anyone on this call would. I know that we do have integration with them, um, but 
honestly, anything I would say would probably be not accurately um, share, you know, accurately uh, stated. So I know we have it. I just, I just don't know enough about it to speak to it. That's okay. Yeah. And um, we can also download all the questions and submit them to you. So we can, yeah, we can, we can certainly get that for the group. Awesome. Okay. We have time for one more question that just came through. Um, does testing pick up COVID in the two week quarantine? Yeah, I, th I can try and answer that. Uh, so the, the answer is it, it can help. Uh, so what we try and tell people is that if they think that they've been exposed to uh, COVID-19 and they're not having symptoms, if you're going to get tested, the best time to get tested is sometime after three days, so day four or five. If your test is negative at that point in time, there's an 80% chance or more that it will remain negative throughout. It's not 100%, but that helps add security to uh, the, the individual who might be worried that they could have acquired, acquired the disease and not be symptomatic. So with your last contact, if it's a close contact, if you want to get tested, do it after day three. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. I know I said last question before, but we had one more just to get through. So I'm going to ask, this is the real last one. Yeah, okay. sure. <laughs> question. Um, so the person asks, my elderly grandparents enjoy unique dining options at an affordable cost. Does St. Luke's have any dining specials for seniors? Yeah, we actually do. You know, at the Monroe campus, we have had a, a senior dining program from almost the beginning. So at dinner time uh, for $3.99, we offer a, uh, a full meal. Wow. And it's something that we've, you know, we've tried to promote during covid we haven't been promoting it, but certainly if a senior comes in and asks for the senior meal, we give it. In fact, we've had some stories of families that uh, some some older adults who, uh, in fact, we got a thank you card from one family. They were both had some health challenges and her, her husband would come over every night and get the meal for them. And they felt it was really um, it was really a lifesaver for them because they just they didn't have the time or the energy to really prepare a meal every day. So they would come over every evening and pick up two meals. So we do have it. Again, we haven't been promoting it, but you can certainly come in seven days a week, 365 days a year to our cafeteria for dinner and just ask what the senior meal option is. It's $3.99 and it's a full meal um, that you can get. So yeah. Awesome. And we have that at other campuses too. I, I believe many of our other campuses have that same offer. Great to know. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you, Dr. Jari, Dr. Merrick, Dr. Tesserero. I am going to turn it over to my colleague with the Pocono Chamber to close us out. Uh, so now Liz Bliss. Thank you so much, Lauren. And thank you so much to all of today's presenters. It was such an amazing program. And I think it's so great to know what's happening right here in our Pocono community. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, St. Luke's University Health Network Monroe Campus. And thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate the time for you take taking to be with us virtually this morning. The Chamber will continue to provide you with the latest resources, important updates, webinars, and virtual networking opportunities. So stay tuned and check out our website and social media pages often. We have tons of great events coming up both in person and virtually, so don't miss out on those great opportunities. On behalf of everyone here at the Pocono Chamber of Commerce and the Greater Lehigh Valley Chamber of Commerce, we, we hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy. We hope to see you soon. So take care, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks for joining us.